Hi. So this is a story that I've really been debating on telling, and it wasn't until I did a podcast recently with Skullgirdle. Uh, if you haven't heard of her channel, definitely check her out. And the Count of Cemetery Confessions that I really decided that this would be a good thing to broach because this is a subject that was broached. And the podcast was a lot to do with aging within the goth subculture as well as the state of goth YouTube and how we feel about certain things regarding it. But one of the subjects was um, people falling out of the goth scene. Now, I thought this was a situation that was intrinsic to just me. I don't know why. We often think that certain things that happen to us just happen to us, but there is a big wide world out there and you'd be hard pressed to find that you were the only person to go through something. And that was definitely the case here. And it really, doing this podcast and being sort of hit with that really drove home that, hey, you're not the only one that this has happened to. And I really wanted to talk about it because it may be happening to you right now, maybe it happened to you in your past, but whatever whatever subculture you happen to be in, be it goth, be it punk, be it a raver, or anything that you're involved in, don't ever let anybody suck that identity out of you. It happened to me. And it had to do with, um, I think it was an article that somebody had written, and what she had written was basically saying that Everybody has experienced that period where they fell out of the goth scene where they just weren't part of it anymore due to uh, being in a relationship with somebody that, say, didn't approve of your lifestyle or just shamed you for it. And, well, that was one of the reasons, and I was like, holy shit, that was me. And I never realized that, okay, this happens to other people. I don't know why I didn't, but it did. So I wanted to discuss that with you because this is something that happened to me and it happened to me in a big way. And I don't want to really get so much into him more along the lines of my reaction to the things that he had done and what he was doing. And I can't fully blame him. Granted, it was a douchebag thing to do, but I didn't have to go along with it. But I did because I felt stuck. And maybe if... I throw out some pointers and maybe you learn from my experiences, you won't get in that situation where you feel so stuck, whereas you have to just change for somebody else. Or in my case, I didn't so much as change into something else, I just reduced to nothing. I was basically nobody. And I, I want to get into that with you. So. When he and I met, it was about 2003, and we met on a website called Live Journal. And if you've never heard of Live Journal, it's pretty self explanatory. It is a live journal. It is an online journal where you chronicle your life, you can make updates about anything, post pictures, and you have you add friends to your live journal. And they can read your journal, comment on your journal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he and I met via that way. And, um,. I would say a good week before that, and I think this is why I was so open to being manipulated, that is because I had gone out to the Hamptons with a good friend of mine at the time, and the Hamptons on Long Island is pretty far east on Long Island, so you're further from the city, less light pollution, and you can really, you can go on the water, you can get a great view of the sky because, again, less light pollution, you can really see the stars really well. So we went to the docks and we're laying down in the docks looking at the sky and we're talking and I just remember a moment of silence that we had just sort of laying there looking up at the sky and I remember thinking as I'm looking at this one star I'm gonna make a wish and I did I made a wish that should there be someone out there for me anybody let them come into my life soon sooner rather than later because I'm, I'm just a hopeless romantic and I love being in love and I love being part of a relationship. I just, that's kind of the person that I am. And I was just so sick of being lonely and having all this, you know, this love and, you know, this romantic sort of mentality and not having anybody to share it with. And it just really sucked. So I made that wish. And when he sent me a message on AOL Instant Messenger, I was receptive to it where normally I would not have been because I was in a relationship at the time. Granted, it was a dead relationship to the point where he and I were just roommates and I was sleeping on the sofa. It was a relationship nonetheless and I made sure in any aspect of my social media, which is all but like three things, I think Friendster, MySpace, and LiveJournal, I made sure that it was known 
I'm in a relationship, don't disrespect that. But he sent me an instant message and I entertained it. And I entertained it so much that we very quickly became an online thing, which felt pretty wrong because I was in a relationship, so I ended it and moved back in with my mother, which was fucking horrible. But I did it. And he lived in England, I live in New York, and we made the plan for him to come and visit. He came and visited, and it was awful. We fought, and it just, it didn't feel like the right fit. But in my head, I had it that, no, you made that wish, this is the person that was meant to come to you. And I, for some reason, just attached myself to that idea, and I went along with it. No. You have to do this. This is the person for you. Make it work. So as much as he sort of fetishized the fact that I was a goth, and he was in the goth scene as well, or so I thought, goth was just the in thing at the time. And I didn't know this about him. It didn't. It took me a good couple of years to see, but he suffered from a series of identity crisis where he went through every single subculture identity that you can imagine. He went from... Um, grunge to goth to punk to hardcore to tattoo enthusiast um, something or other I don't quite know what that was but anything he really saw he could watch a movie and then sort of become so obsessed that he embodies a character in that movie for an extended period until he becomes bored and what happened was he was so much into the goth thing that he became enamored of me and after you know we had gotten married so this is going forward i moved to england we got married the goth phase left him and he was sort of like after two sort of subcultures he went through punk and then something else i forget what he's looking at me and shaming me for being interested in the things that i am for listening to goth music for dressing the way that i do for always looking the way that i do sort of making these comments that you look the same as you did when you were a teenager. You never change, as if that were a bad thing. And I began to think, wow, I must be a really boring person. Because you have to understand, I'm living in England now. He's all I got. I don't have any friends. I don't have anything else. So I am, I'm stuck. I am completely surrounded by nothing but him. So he pretty much became my world. So my life was it was a living hell basically because everything had to suit him and when things didn't he just haunted and poked and poked and poked and it was relentless it was like Chinese water torture all you wanted was peace and my only semblance of peace was to just fucking give in and give him what he wanted but before that happened I didn't let go without a fight so there was a goth night happening and it was happening in a city called Norwich. At the time I was living in Chesterfield, England, and it was happening in Norwich, and it was called Chains on Velvet. And a good friend of mine who, he was actually, he's, he's an American, in the Air Force, in the UK, and he was DJing this goth night. He said, yeah, come down, come visit. I'll put you guys on the list. It'll be awesome. So I'm like, yes. I had been, you know, so immersed in, in this Chesterfield life and with this person, and I was really feeling like I was losing myself out. So I was super excited about it. He was happy to get out anyway, which, you know, I didn't really give a fuck about it. I just wanted to go out and I wanted to dance and I wanted to hear my music and I wanted to be amongst my freaking people and finally get a look at the UK goth scene. So we went. And we went and then the first person that I'm introduced to uh, after Joe walks us up the stairs, at the very top of the stairs is a guy named Stuart who he introduces us to. And it was so weird when I met him because I didn't have any romantic feelings. But when he introduced us, he and I sort of locked eyes and I knew this person is going to change my life in some way. I don't know how, but he's going to be a major part of my life. Little did I know, a few years down the road, I would end up divorced and marrying him. <laughs> but we'll get to that. So. We go to the club and Stuart and I become fast friends. Uh, we're all hanging out together, me, Stuart, and my ex-husband, and we went 
not paintballing. We went, uh, we played laser tag. We went to the cafes. We went, we did everything. We hung out quite a lot. And then we went back to Chesterfield and lost touch. Well, things had gotten significantly worse over the years with my ex and I. And it was really, where it was a little bit of a nagging, it got to the point where it was just unbearable, the shaming that I was getting for being a goth. And he even, I mean, I don't want to get into the specifics about it, but I will say that um, as a result, I was shamed into cutting my hair off. Um, I became so freaking normal and not to say that being normal, I mean, what is normal really, but not to say like being normal is a bad thing, but even people who dress normally, they have some semblance of a personality. They, they know who they are. They have likes, they have dislikes, they have hobbies. I had nothing. I had everything sucked out of me because all I wanted was peace. That's all I wanted. And to be shamed so much for being who I was and never changing, I believed, I honestly truly believed that the fact that I didn't change was a negative thing, was because I was boring, not because I was being true to myself, which now I realize I'm a goth, it's who I am, I'm being true to myself, the fact that I don't change, that's just fucking stability that is just that that should further reinforce the fact that I am who I am and at the time I was just thinking I'm so boring I never change I like the same things and I feel so stupid for that so if you ever do a google search a google image search for me um I'll post a few pictures here but if you ever do a google image search for me you can actually tell the periods that I was with him because I was always wearing gray. Gray became my sad color and it was the only color that I wore. Can't even remember listening to any music. There was just there was nothing it was void I was completely empty and then it ended um, I was living in England and and I don't want to say uh, the reasons why yeah I'm not gonna go there um, I don't want to get too specific but it ended just as Stuart's relationship was getting really bad and he was cheated on and really struggling with that and didn't quite know how to handle that and he and I bonded over that we bonded over the fact that we were in these relationships with people who didn't like monogamy his ex didn't like monogamy didn't see the point in cohabitation did not want to be in a monogamous relationship she didn't want to be married and neither did mine mine wanted an open relationship mine wanted all these different things that I did not sign up for <laughs> so Having to come to terms with that was really hard, and being in England, having nobody, Stuart and I became really close. And um, he had ended things with his girlfriend, uh, things were ended with mine, and then suddenly one night we went from friends to not anymore. And <laughs> from that point on, we have never been apart. The only time we were apart is when the immigration process began and I had to come back to the US for three months to sort of sort things out because we had to be separated and that was tough but we other than that we we've never we've never seen a day apart which um, and we don't want to and I'm cool with that um, but I guess what I'm trying to say <clears throat> sort of going back I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place with this story but he started helping me bring me back out of myself. Stuart's a goth. He'd been a goth from the moment I met him and he's still a goth to this day. He nurtured the fact that I was goth and really tried to bring that back out of me. Bring me back out of myself and, and say, you know, the way that you are now versus the way you were when I first met you is two entirely different things. It's like somebody had just completely extracted all of the Angela out of you and he did 
they actually did do that and I didn't realize it how bad it was and it took a lot of time and we went to every goth night that we possibly could and we um you know we everything we did it wasn't 100 percent goth but everything that we did was 100 percent things that i wanted to do or he wanted to do but since we shared a lot of the same interests it was still things that were very intrinsically us and that in itself helped me really come back out and become the person that i'd always had been i just buried and after a few years I was almost 100% back and the reason I was only almost 100% back is because I had a lot of damage done. There was a lot, a lot of damage done. What really, really helped me, I mean drive it home like 100% I'm freaking back, was YouTube. So I started researching again. I wanted to know what was going on in the world of goth because I was out of the goth scene for a really long time, a good few years. Once I moved to England. That was really it. I was out of the goth scene. I had no idea what was going on. And when I returned to New York, it was weird because it was like I returned to an apocalypse. Because it was nothing like it was when I left. I left New York in 2005 and I remember my last hurrah before I went was actually seeing Veen V Nation perform. And we were in the VIP area and we were just watching from above and I remember I was um, dancing with my friends and we were having so much fun and it was, um, you know, the reason I was in the VIP area is not because I was like super cool, it was because uh, my friends had organized the night, so I was with them. But that was my last hurrah and it was just, it was so much fun. It would seem like all of New York was there, it, the energy was amazing and I had a, an amazing time and then two days later, I'm on a flight to England. And that was it. And when I came back to New York, everything was shut down. All of the goth nights, nothing was around. And I began looking on YouTube to see what the hell is going on in the world of goth. And that's when I was hit with some shit that I could not grasp. I can't even explain it, but I just remember looking at people, and I know this is going to sound really judgmental, and I'm like, what the fuck is this poser? And that's the 90s me coming out, saying like, you know, we used to call people posers who were in it just to be cool. It wasn't a word that we threw out just to insult somebody. It was, a, it was an observation. It was a person who wasn't in it because they loved it. It was a person who was in it because they wanted to seem cool. They didn't love the music. They didn't love the fashion. They didn't love the subculture. They just wanted the attention. They wanted to scare the normies. And no, that's not what it's all about. And that just pissed me off. What really um, sent it home for me was listening to one of my favorite songs by Faith and the Muse. And it's called Sparks. And I'm listening to this song, and it's one of those songs to me that just brings instant nostalgia. And it's one of those songs, I have a, I have a kind of a list of songs that you don't just hear, you kind of feel here. Sorry, something's popping up on my screen. It's one of those things that you don't just hear, you feel. And when a song resonates with you like that, it can really just bring forth so many memories, so many thoughts and ideas and just bring out such creative aspects of yourself and that's what it did. So I'm laying there, Faith in the Muse is playing and I'm off in my own head and suddenly it hits me. I'm gonna make a YouTube video and my main focus was I wanted to basically, I wanted to detach people from the whole consumerist, vapid, Kardashianization of the subculture that I'd been seeing and show them a different perspective. Because the way that this song made me feel embodied everything that the goth scene had made me feel and I wanted to project that and I wanted you to experience that as well. And it came to me that I wasn't going to speak in this video. I just wanted you to hear the songs, see the imagery, read the words and interpret it your own way. I wanted you to pull from your own heart and your own creativity and interpret it as you would, not as somebody else is telling you it should be. And that video was like an anniversary, a homecoming. It was 
it was the very video that pretty much solidified who I am, and this is gonna sound so cheesy, but it's as if I had been buffering to some degree for several years, and then once I had made that video, it was like I'd hit 100% completed, and I was finally back after being gone for so long. And it was it's a scary, uh, confusing, frustrating feeling to just lose yourself like that. And I was for a really long time. And getting my YouTube channel really going, being able to share these experiences with you, um, being able to show you these 90s hacks, all of the things that I've been able to share, it's like, it was a reminder. It was reminding me of the person that I was, am, and will always be. And without that, I don't know if I would fully be back to the person that I am. So YouTube, I have to thank for bringing me back to the freaking person that I was and undoing the damage that happened <laughs> in the past. Don't want to say any names and I don't want to give anybody credit for, you know, they're douchebaggery. When we're attracted to somebody, we're attracted to them for who they are, not for what they can be. So if somebody ever tries to ridicule you or shame you for the things that you love or who you are, stand your ground or walk away because they're trying to turn you into a puppet. And if you're in that situation right now, I just hope that you can find some solace in this video and know that you're not lost, but there is hope and there is happiness outside of the situation that you're in right now. You're never stuck. Take care.